The world of Ready or Not is one of turmoil and corruption. The city of Los Sueños can be described in many a way, but one word in particular sums up the city perfectly. Evil. The city of Los Sueños is festering with evil. So far, we've seen that evil takes form in a multitude of ways. Murderers, bank robbers, psychopaths, you name it. But the kind of evil we'll be talking about today is truly in a league of its own. We've covered some serious topics in the series so far, but none have gotten to the levels of disturbing that this mission reaches. And I'm sure all of us will never forget finding that room the first time playing this mission. Welcome to the Ready or Not Lore series, where in today's episode, I try and not get demonetized as we talk about the mission Valley of the Dolls. This video will be divided up into two sections, the first being all in-game slash developer confirmed information, and the second being my own theories as to where the story and world may go. If you wish to jump to a specific section, timestamps will be in the description. Having taken down a distribution center for an illegal CP ring operating out of Los Sueños, the LSPD cybercrime team has now located the man profiting from its sales, Amos Vol. LSPD SWAT has been sent to his home in Los Clemente in order to apprehend the suspect. Coinciding on the day of the raid just so happens to be Vol's daughter, Janie's 18th birthday, one she will soon never forget. Entering the premises, we immediately see Vol's mansion is guarded by Bolton Security, a well-equipped and lethal private security company. We really don't know much about these guys. We could find the names of who's on duty and their paychecks, but that's really about it. They currently only appear on this map and the map The Spider, which are both linked, so maybe there's some connection with Bolton Security and the more, shall we say, illicit things going on on both of those maps. Stepping through the front gate, we see that Janie was gifted with a brand new Mercedes G-Wagon, with a list of those attending the party and a metal detector wand nearby. Now, this mansion is quite big, so we'll be going floor by floor, starting with the first floor. By the entrance, we see signs directing party attendees to not enter the front door, but rather go down the steps to the right and through the second floor. The first floor, as the sign says, is for adults only, which is odd until you step through the front door and realize just what kind of house this is. You see, Mr. Vol and his wife are adult entertainers, rather successful ones at that. We see right when we open the front door, multiple posters and a video of Amos Vol's wife, Daniela Vol, from 2011. Now, we don't know Daniela's exact age, but based on her appearance in this video, and the fact that it was 11 years prior to the raid, she looks a little on the young side, which we'll soon realize is a common theme in this house. Moving into the bathroom, we can find some hard drives in the tub, and occasionally we can meet Mrs. Vol hiding in the closet. We know this is her, because she will say, Get out of my house! And she will literally beat the shit out of you if you get too close, so keep your distance, because them claws hurt. That's what you fucking get. Taking the door leading to the balcony, we can find a security logbook that reads 1115, Shona dropped off by chauffeurs, couldn't see. 1120, S greeted by AV. 1230, S plus Janie visibly excited. About what? 1237, Gardner put tool in pocket. Looks like Jam will have to have a chat with him. 330, eight plus guests arrive. Four, more guests, total count now 54. 6.30, guest countdown to just the kids. 8 to 9 others, no AV or DV though. By the looks of this logbook, we don't really get much other than the fact that this was a pretty bumping party. Anyway, moving into the bedroom, we get an eyeful of a lot of things. On the shelf, there are multiple, um, awards and something in a glass Oh my god! It appears this is a room where the quote-unquote magic happens. There are skimpy clothes on mannequins, wine, a Kama Sutra book, posters of both of the Vol's work, and a lighting setup. It appears right before the raid started, they were filming a scene. Which is also when their daughter's party was going on, which... Ew. We pass a spare bedroom and a personal gym, both of which don't really have anything in them. Nearing the stairs, we find a box addressed to Bucharest, Romania, with a note nearby from Daniela Vol telling Bolton to take the box to the post office and send it today. 
I assume inside the box is a hard drive with some illegal shit on it. Also, based on Daniela's accent and the location of this package, I think it's safe to assume she's from Romania or some Eastern European country. Turning around and sitting on the steps is another note that reads, Janie, you little child, don't touch the sculptures ever. Birthday or not, I will tell daddy. I assume this is from Miss Vol, and this also hints at a rocky relationship between Janie and Daniela. Moving downstairs, we can find Janie's room with a note on the door reading, Dad, tell your dogs to stay out of my room. Caught Andy in here while I was tutoring. You're not the only one who knows how to use a camera. Well, being creepy, this tells us some more information about Janie. She's a tutor, and moving into her room, we see she's a complete contradiction to her father. On her whiteboard, we learn she's very organized and extremely environmentally conscious. There's a poster that says, there's no plan B for Earth, pictures of her hiking, running, and cleaning up a beach. On her computer, she's logged into Greenside Ecological College, which I imagine is some environmentally friendly college based on the website design. On her TV, we see she watches a lot of documentaries about climate change and the environment. There's also a magazine on the ground talking about the eco-friendly guide to DIY and recycling, and on her calendar, which confirms the map takes place in April 2022, there is a climate change protest scheduled for the 24th. What's also really interesting is if you go around the corner in her room, you could find a laptop where she's selling her brand new G-Wagon on the same day she got it, promising to send all the proceeds to charity. While also exploring Jenny's room, we can find a box labeled Mom's Stuff and a picture with a note from her father saying, Janie, your mother was always such a great subject to photograph. Here's one of my favorites of her. Happy birthday, sweetheart. I love you. Dad. P.S. I know you and Danny don't see eye to eye, but she loves you too. This, as well as the picture of a woman most likely going through cancer treatments, confirms Janie's mother is no longer with us, and Daniela Vol is her stepmother, explaining their rough relationship. But it also appears that Janie is also hitting a rough patch with her father as his picture is crossed out above her bed. Also on her bed, we can find a note that has some nearly indecipherable text written on it saying, To Janie, on your special day, from mom. Leaving Janie's room, we can find what I assume is Vol's office with a note that reads, No guests allowed in this room. Wouldn't want to have to teach you a lesson if I catch you in there. A. Vol. Moving in, we find papers and hard drives everywhere, a picture of Vol with children, most likely in Africa, and directly leading outside, we can find three boxes recently burned and still smoldering. Leaving his office, we can find a bar with two magazines nearby. One states, Amos Vol, man of the year, porn star philanthropist, gives his stunning life story. And the other is the magazine I covered in the last episode, but at least now we can confirm that it is Vol on both covers. With nothing else of note on this floor, we can now move down to the ground floor. In the kitchen, we can find all the checks addressed to all of the Bolton security personnel on site, as well as a note from Vol telling them to be discreet. And speaking of Amos Vol, we can find the man himself inside his theater room. He is armed and will attack us on site, but he can easily be apprehended. Stepping outside into the backyard, we could see Janie's party in all its glory. Magical color-changing presents, tents, balloons galore, and burgers cooking on the grill. We also can find a very large stage where presumably Vol paid for one of Janie's favorite artists, potentially Live Rat, or if you're like me when you first read this, you thought it said Liver Forty, so it's, it's, it's one of those two, probably Live Rat. Anyway, near the pool, we can find a card that some guests have signed and left their best wishes. Next to this, we can find a box that is the result of a selfie contest Mr. Vol put on during Janie's party. If we would have went down the side of the house instead of the front door, we would have seen another poster advertising this competition. Also, ew. Going around the other side of the house, we could find the garden where the gardener presumably stole the tool the guard mentioned. We can find some notes on how to properly water and care for plants, presumably written by Janie. We can also find a note written by Daniela telling the Bolton security guys to wipe their feet before entering the house. Other than that, I have been able to find Janie outside here a few times. It's this girl right here. What's going on? It's my birthday! But as far as I could tell, she doesn't really see anything of interest. Regardless, there isn't anything else going on on the ground floor or outside, so let's go down one more floor into the basement. Opening a gate, we can make our way down into the deep underbelly of the mansion. What first looks like your typical storage room quickly becomes something far more dire. In the hallway, you can find three doors, and in chalk, a hopscotch grid drawn on the ground. Nearby, we can find rows and rows of folders with names and ages, all of them children. Entering the first room, we see a terrifying sight, a recreation of a little girl's room. A bed 
toys, a cradle, candy bars, and the same professional lighting setup as seen upstairs. Entering the next room, we see more boxes and crates. However, as we step into another room, we see the ground tore up with toys and children's clothing thrown about. Inspecting the ground, we see these barrels have been hastily buried with toys and children's clothes thrown in as well. It appears they were in the process of hiding these barrels before we arrived. Entering the last room, we discover just what Vol has been up to. We find Amos Vol's dark room, where we can see he's processing pictures of children. There are even more files with names and ages in here as well. In this room, we can also find a recorder playing something strange. Now, I tried to clean this up the best I could, but didn't really come up with anything. I'm not an audio engineer, so maybe those of you who are could try and crack what they're saying, because I'm lost. The most I could gather out of this recording is that there are two people talking. I assume it's Vol, the deeper voice, talking to a little girl, the higher voice. To the right of this recorder, we could find another room. Entering this room, we see more photos of children on the ground that lead us like a trail into a nightmare. A collage of photos along the wall creates the visage of two little girls, one smiling, one emotionless, with text written all around saying, Daddy's good little princess, so pure, soft, innocent, sweet, smooth, fragile, clean, and untouched. Along the floor we can find more photos, and what looks like a bedroll, so I think it's safe to assume this is where Vol takes his pictures and keeps the children. Despite all the incriminating photos of children here, we can't find any just their remnants. With this sickening final discovery, this concludes our investigation of Amos Vol. Amos Vol, man of the year and porn star philanthropist, is a monster. He reminds me of Mr. Jefferson from Life is Strange, that being a photographer obsessed with capturing that perfection, that purity. So much so that he turned to, in his mind, the most purest subject to photograph, children. As I just mentioned, we never found any children in this map only toys and clothes. I think it's safe to assume all those barrels are what's left of them. Most likely, they were in the process of dissolving them, the evidence, then disposing the waste at some other location. That was probably their MO for some time, but their plan was interrupted as Vol got wind of an impending LSPD raid. He probably had his goons tear up the floor in what I'd call the barrel room and bury as many of those barrels as possible, then cover them up with cement all before the cops arrive. We see this hasted action in the files we found smoldering and some of the hard drives submerged in the bathtub. They thought they had more time, or potentially, Vol thinking that surely the cops wouldn't raid on his daughter's birthday, got sloppy with the cover-up job. That's why we find things half-assed and not fully disposed of. We caught him red-handed. Now, we don't know why Jamie hates her dad, but I have a feeling this has something to do with her mother's passing. Based on the letter sitting on Jamie's bed, it's safe to assume she must have died recently. Recent enough to have a handwritten letter delivered to her daughter post-mortem. This implies Amos left Janie's mother and remarried Daniela while she was still very much alive. Whether or not Janie's mother knew of Amos's illegal activity is unknown. I lean more on the side of not knowing because I imagine Vol would have had her killed and we can see she died because of some kind of cancer and she was going through chemo. There's also nothing to prove this, but if I were to take a guess where Janie got her environmentally conscious side from, it would be her mother. Maybe her mother was some kind of environmental activist and during Vol's philanthropy days, he met her, fell in love, and had Janie. The aftermath of what happened to Vol is unknown, but I don't think this is the last we'll see of him, or Janie. Vol is way too big of a public figure to simply disappear in the background. He was man of the year, a philanthropist, and a very positive public figure. I imagine all of his holdings will be investigated and his family will lose everything. Something tells me all the fortune he made through his photography and other adult activities was only half the truth. I imagine they were simply fronts for a money laundering scheme of trafficking CP and children in and out of Romania and Los Sueños. 
As for Janie, I feel her life just got a whole lot harder. All of her father's assets are basically gone. I imagine Daniela and Amos are both locked up, and her last name is basically a stain on her reputation forever. Even if Janie takes her mother's last name, whatever that may be, her life is still basically over. I can't imagine any college wanting to associate with the daughter of a convicted pedo slash murderer, even with all the positive things she did in her past. Maybe as a way to save face, and based on Janie's proclivity for activism, I imagine in future maps we'll see magazine covers or posters advertising Janie, leading protests against sexual trafficking and shifting away from environmental issues and more toward societal issues. However, if she does this, I feel like society will just end up pitying her and not taking her very seriously at all. Like, imagine this. If after all of the Epstein stuff came out, he had a daughter, and she was all of a sudden on the front page of every magazine saying, yeah, pedos are bad. After her father's conviction, everyone, and I mean everyone, would collectively tell her to go f herself. If Janie does in fact go down this road, she would eventually fade out into obscurity with her life completely over. Regardless, Amos Vol was apprehended and his CP ring destroyed. But I have this feeling, if you cut off the head of a Hydra, two more will take its place.